Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Live at Four on this Thursday. Hope you all had a great day. Our weather continues to be beautiful, but our thoughts are with our friends and family in the Carolinas yeah, today. That, that's what's topping our news today. The East Coast is bracing for the arrival of Hurricane Florence. We'll have the latest on evacuations, and local Red Cross help is on the way. The president is getting pushback after he tweets that the Democrats made up the number of deaths caused by Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. And there is state help coming to fix the rail line near Middleton that was washed out by our recent flooding. Let's take a look outside today. Oh, first of all, first at four, Hurricane Florence has begun to batter the Carolina coast, and the storm is not going away anytime soon. This is a live look from an old Coast Guard light station at Frying Pan Shoals. That's about 34 miles off the coast of North Carolina. This is a, it's actually an Airbnb now that pe people can rent up, but obviously uh, they're not there now. This flag has began to shred just after one o'clock our time. Outer bands from the hurricane are now lashing land at least a full day before the National Hurricane Center expects the slow moving storm's eye to blow ashore around the North Carolina, South Carolina line. Winds have diminished to 105 miles an hour, dropping it to a category two storm. But as Courtney Zabowski reports from Wilmington, North Carolina, forecasters say it is no less dangerous. Bands of rain are whipping the Carolinas as Hurricane Florence approaches. Aside from the daredevils in the water, these coastal communities have cleared out. I heard it was going to be the storm of a lifetime. In North Carolina, Marcy Akers arrived at this inland shelter after hearing the warnings. The cops told me I needed to evacuate. What did they say? They said that it was going to be a bad storm for trailers. The winds have weakened, but forecasters are predicting storm surges up to 12 feet and days of drenching rain. We're still forecasting 20 to 30 inches, possibly 40 inches or more. We're in Wilmington, North Carolina. Less than a mile away, Wrightsville Beach is right in the bullseye. And even here, residents feel the danger. John Bruschetta says he's never seen waves breaking so close. You can see the spray even without uh, binoculars or anything. You can, the water's pretty high. What does that say to you? Uh, not, in not too much longer of a time, we're going to have uh, those waves will be breaking here. The view from space shows the massive storm hovering offshore. It's due to hit land early Friday and linger through Saturday. With just hours to go, evacuations are still underway. We are asking citizens to please heed a warning. Um, your time is running out. Emergency officials say floods are likely and power will go out for days, if not weeks. Courtney Zabowski for WISC News 3. And more than a thousand flights scheduled for today and tomorrow have been canceled with some airports in the Carolinas essentially shutting down. Let's head out to the weather patio now. Dana Fulton is watching the forecast and this is just the beginning. Just the beginning. I know uh, a lot of folks in South Carolina use the closing of a Waffle House to indicate that things are getting really bad. So they've been posting Waffle House closing and Walmart closing updates. Of course, the airport's also closing down. The storm is a massive storm moving right towards the coast right now. The right side of a hurricane is actually the most dangerous or what's considered the most dangerous side not rolling out the right side but if you look along the hurricane track the right side sees usually the stronger winds and also that storm surge being thrust up towards North Carolina and the coast of Virginia even included in this I know we're focusing a lot on the Carolinas but everywhere along the Atlantic coast certainly going to feel an impact from Hurricane Florence right now it is a category two hurricane that category three threshold that was dropped to category two last night the winds between 110 and 111 miles per hour doesn't sound like that big of a difference uh, that's the line. That's the cutoff for a category two to category three. So it has been downgraded. The winds, so I doubt just a little bit, but still 100 mile per hour sustained winds is no joke. Continuing west northwest for just a little longer. And then by Friday morning, we are expecting a landfall sometime tomorrow along that South Carolina, North Carolina border. And then the storm is going to drop southwest and curve through South Carolina, soaking parts of Appalachia, stretching all the way up towards the New England area as we head into the start of next week. But notice that moisture staying 
moving towards the east coast. Part of the reason we're so clear and sunny because everything's being sucked in that direction. We're seeing a lot of rain there. We're also seeing some very, very strong winds. Chance of 40 plus mile per hour wind gusts with tropical storm strength winds possible throughout much of the coastline for the Carolinas and even all the way into the upstate of, of both South and North Carolina. The chance to see some very strong wind gusts. Rainfall totals are going to be substantial over the next several days along the coast. Some areas could see up to 40 inches certainly possible. So storm surge, wind gusts, and of course the, the rainfall, catastrophic rainfall. We've experienced that over the last few weeks, so we can understand how devastating this is to a lot of business that really thrive during this time of the year, during the summer months along the coast. We may see some flash flooding, especially along the rivers, as all of that rain continues to drain back towards the ocean for the middle of next week. And there is the chance to see a few tornadoes along with those hur that hurricane as it does move inland. For us back here at home, things really do look fantastic. Not to just switch the subject too much, but uh, for us tomorrow, we'll be warm yet again again with a few clouds in the sky along with some sunshine. We'll bounce over for your first alert traffic update right now. If you're getting ready to hit the roads, it should be a fairly smooth drive uh, for much of Madison. No major incidents to point out for you right now over at 14. Of course, still closed between Cross Plains and Black Earth along the Beltline. If you're anywhere near Fish Hatchery Road, westbound's about 30 miles per hour, eastbound about 21 over closer to John Nolan Drive, westbound a little faster at about 65 miles per hour, eastbound still cruising close to 20 miles per hour. From the Beltline to James will take you about 28 minutes. Middleton to Sauk City, 18, and then downtown to Sun Prairie, about 17 minutes for your Thursday afternoon. But we'll take a closer look at what's ahead for us this weekend and when our next chance for rain is going to creep into the forecast in just a few minutes. All right, very good. We'll check back in a little while. Thank you, Dana. The Red Cross in Wisconsin is now sending 41 volunteers to help with Hurricane Florence disaster relief efforts. Dave Caulfield spoke with two of those volunteers about to head out there this weekend, and he joins us now with their story from the Weather Center. Dave? Mark and Susan, listen to this. Red Cross volunteers June, uh, Judy Giacomino and June Shakasheri have been working for three weeks straight assisting with flood relief efforts across south, central, and southern Wisconsin. They have today off and then Saturday they'll fly to Raleigh to help with Hurricane Florence relief in Virginia and the Carolinas. Now Judy and June are part of the disaster assessment team for the Red Cross, the second wave of volunteers. They'll go in and find the hard hit areas and provide vital food, shelter and supplies to those who need it most. Judy and June say the most important lesson they've learned from the Wisconsin floods is to practice patience, which they'll need to do again, helping victims of Florence. There's nothing worse to recover from than flooding. It takes so long for the water to go down and then to clean up after it. So we expect we'll be there a long time. You know, one of us can't get the job done, right? It's, it's going to take thousands of us to, to get in there and accomplish what needs to be done. Now, Judy and June also said that volunteers from the Carolinas helped out across southern Wisconsin with the flooding here, and it feels good to return the favor as Florence bears down on the southeast. And the off day for the volunteers wasn't all rest and relaxation. June said she needs to get a few new pairs of waterproof shoes, which they'll definitely need to fend off more flooding. They'll be volunteering there for at least three weeks, but could be in the Carolinas and Virginia for much longer. Good for them. And Judy all, and June, way to yeah, go. All yeah. volunteer work. All right, Dave, thank you. Thank you, Dave. While the government prepares for the impact of Hurricane Florence, President Trump is tweeting about Hurricane Maria, which hit Puerto Rico a year ago, and defending himself from criticism over his administration's response. Angelica Alvarez has more from the White House. I think, was tremendous. I think that Puerto Rico was an incredible unsung success. President Trump continues to defend his administration's response to Hurricane Maria, which devastated Puerto Rico last year. This morning, he tweeted, 3,000 people did not die in the two hurricanes that hit Puerto Rico. When I left the island, after the storm had hit, they had anywhere from 6 to 18 deaths. Then, a long time later, they started to report really large numbers, like 3,000. This was done by the Democrats in order to make me look as bad as possible. Wait, say that again. The president is blaming Democrats for the Puerto Rico death toll. He says the death toll is not accurate. What do you make of that? I don't know anything about that. A government commissioned report estimates nearly 3,000 people died in Puerto Rico six months after Maria's impact. That's up from the initial death toll of 64. The casualties uh, mounted for a long time. 
So I have no reason to dispute those numbers. Before I would even comment on it further, is I want to look at that study, and if this is going to be a big issue, this would be something this committee certainly can take a look at. San Juan Mayor Carmen Yulín Cruz tweeted, this is what denial following neglect looks like. Mr. President, in the real world, people died on your watch. Your lack of respect is appalling. If the president thinks that losing 3,000 lives on his watch is a success, I hate to think what he considers a failure. FEMA admits it was unprepared for Maria's destruction, but says it has learned lessons that will help with future storms like Florence. Angelica Alvarez for WISC News 3. And New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez tweeted a response to President Trump saying, quote, you're right, Mr. President, the hurricane didn't kill 3,000 people. Your botched response did. Well, some seniors in the Madison apartment complex are finally able to return home today, three weeks to the day that they were evacuated from their homes. All the residents at the Prairie Park Senior Apartments had to evacuate after the building's basement was flooded. That's more than 100 seniors, 55 or older. Floodwaters did more than one and a half million dollars in damage, ruining the entire electrical system. Greystone Property Management says residents on the first floor are able to move back in today, but those on the second and third floors will likely have to wait until the elevator works again. The company hopes that will be completed by next Tuesday. The Wisconsin Department of Transportation is bolstering flood cleanup efforts. As part of an agreement with Wisconsin and Southern, the DOT will award the railroad company $750,000. But as our Keeley Arthur reports, there are some conditions. Keeley? That's right. Thousands of feet of this track were ravaged by the floods. As you can see here in Middleton, things are looking pretty good, but it's a different story further west of us. Parts unusable. Now that's hurting companies that rely on this railway. To fix that, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation will grant Wisconsin and Southern $750,000 or up to 80% of the total cost of repairs. That's as long as crews fix the stretch between Madison and Prairie du Chien by September 22nd. So why are taxpayer dollars going to this? Well, that's because the state, county, and the railroad company jointly own this track. Back to you. All right, Keely Arthur reporting live for us from Middleton. Thank you. The fight between Dane County's district attorney and a former assistant DA is ending with a settlement. Former assistant district attorney Bob Jamboys filed a lawsuit claiming that district attorney Ishmael Ozan forced him out of the DA's office. In 2016, Jamboys challenged his boss in a primary election for district attorney. He then filed a lawsuit claiming Ozan retaliated against him for running by harassing him and giving him a large case load. The lawsuit was settled this week for $350,000. Wisconsin taxpayers will bear the cost of the settlement. Well, up next here on Live at 4, we'll find out what's happening in the 608 this weekend with Emmy Fink. And we'll tell you about a new partnership between UW Health and Facebook. They're looking into how much social media engagement affects our children's health. And we'll have that story when Live at 4 continues. It's the...
Welcome back to UW School of Medicine and Public Health is teaming up with Facebook for a very important study. It's a question that all parents want to know. How much does social media impact the health of our children? Charlotte Deleste is in the newsroom with details on this partnership. Charlotte? Susan and Mark, the UW says this is part of Facebook's $1 million commitment to study the relationship between teens' use of technology and their mental and social well-being. Dr. Megan Moreno will lead the project. She's the head of the UW Social Media and Adolescent Health Research Team. She tells us she has worked with Facebook in studying its impact on children unofficially before, and the social media company reached out to her to further her research. One set of questions I hear all the time in clinic from parents and kids is, what's the right amount of media use? Is social media bad for kids? Is it good for kids? What should I be doing with my kids with social media? And that those really parent and kid focused questions are the ones we're hoping to answer with this research project. Dr. Moreno says her team will evaluate things like confidence in their subjects. Can they stay focused? Do they feel like they have good friends? Things, she says, aren't always measured in a traditional clinical study. The UW says the research is part of Facebook's $1 million commitment to work with others in the industry to explore the impact of social media on children. And this study will begin this fall. Mark and Susan? Very interesting yeah. research. Big question. I always mm -hmm. wonder it myself. Charlotte Deliste in the newsroom, thank you. Stocks rebounded on Wall Street as inflation slows and the tech stocks rebound. The Dow Industrials added 147 points to close at 26,145. The Nasdaq Composite Index added 59 and the S&P 500 was up 15. Well, it is almost the weekend in the 608. Emmy Fink is here with a look at what's going on around town this weekend. Hi, Emmy. Good, good to see you. Good to see you guys. Good to see we you. I promise I'm going to be back. I think I've got like a good four weeks in me before I have another vacation. Oh, so, good, you good. Know. I'm off next week, so. Oh, man. <laughs> see, we just keep missing each other. Well, we're here now, aren't That's we? That's right. Well, seize let's, the, make seize the best. Day. let's make the best of it. The good <laughs> idea. The weather is beautiful. It's a perfect night to get outside, do a little shopping. I like that idea. So it's the last chance to get to the Madison Night Market. Market, the last chance for the season. It's where Gilman and State Street meets. The market brings together vendors, little handmade products, artisan gifts, local art, fresh produce, food, and the night is rounded out with some live music, pop-up restaurants, and food carts. My favorite, it starts at 6, goes till 11 o'clock. Wow. Those are some dedicated shoppers. <laughs> Well, the food, I think, would be... Going food on. keeps you there, right. Absolutely. All right, a uh, world gathering here in Madison. You know, isn't it every weekend there is something oh, yeah. globally happening in Madison? I just love that about the city. Well, dancers and um, musicians from around the world will bring together their talented artistry in Madison for the World Music Festival. Performance will take place at the Union South, the Memorial Union, and the Willie Street Fair. Now, Friday, it kicks off from 4 to 9 at the Union. Bands from Puerto Rico, Sweden, and Canada. And then the world music starts up again Saturday at 2 at the Willie Street Fair. Groups from Turkey and Latin America back at the terrace Saturday night for some Cuban dance music. Oh, that, that sounds, sounds like my great. favorite. That is cool. <laughs> and speaking of, you know fall is almost here when Willie, when the Willie Street Fair It's a returns. local East yeah. Side favorite. Mm -hmm. I've never been, but I, oh, it's a blast. I need to get there. And you, people should get excited because there are three stages of music this weekend for the fair. It takes place both Saturday and Sunday. Get Back Wisconsin, which is the local Beatles cover band. They'll be there along with Wheelhouse and the Kissers. And then there's a dedicated global music all for the... Uh, World Music Festival, which mm -hmm. will be housed there as well. So it gets underway 11 o'clock. Don't miss the Willie Street Parade. That's really what you want to go for, right? Yes, the 11 o'clock parade on Sunday is... <laughs> If you miss that, you miss it all. It is quite a sight. It's quite a sight. And it all goes to benefit the Wilmar Community Center and the Commonwealth Development. So right. you're having a great time right. and you're giving back. And the weather's going to be great. Mm -hmm. We have the Gypsy Swing Festival. It's the own Madison Jazz Band Harmonious Whale. They're getting everybody together. They're going to welcome international stars to Fitchburg's Art in the Barn Friday and Saturday. So Alfonso Ponticelli, a great name. He's from Chicago. He's going to get the event going on Friday night, followed by the Robin Nolan Trio of Amsterdam and more. And then after 10 o'clock, both nights, again, these late night people, I give it up to them. There's a monster jam session and an outdoor campfire jam session. Well, yeah, the airport's going to be busy. Though. People yeah. coming from all over the world here. There, this is going to be a great weekend to it get is. out and experience some fun stuff.
How about a little musical theater for the whole family? We always like to include something for the kids too. So this is it, uh, Flat Stanley Jr. It's the adventures of a 10 year old who's been flattened by a fallen bulletin board. If we're not scaring kids back into school, I don't know that this <laughs> will help, but the Sun Prairie Civic Theater will take the audience around the globe and search for a way to make Stanley become three dimensional once again. It's a show by kids for kids. Uh, Friday and Saturday night at 7 o'clock, Sunday at 2. And now, go ahead and dig in. Yeah, we got a little road trip here. We've been waiting. It's one of my favorite festivals. Susan lived in Switzerland. My ancestors are from Switzerland. And this weekend, in honor of cheese lovers everywhere, it's the Green County Cheese Days in Monroe, the oldest food festival in the Midwest. Cheese making, dairy farming, all of those Swiss traditions that are so deeply rooted in Green County. So what did you bring for we us? We have some mild cheddar, some Asiago, and some Swiss, because, you know, not everybody likes Swiss. They think it, some people it tastes like feet. Well, shame on you for thinking that. So <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go ahead and eat it. I yeah. love it, too. I have Swiss cheese every lunch, every noon. I, you know, Good I just stuff. love you more and more <laughs> each week. Turkey and Swiss. I see why they paired you together. You know, she lived there, you eat it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes for good chemistry. Lots going on. Boy, yeah, what a busy weekend. weekend. Mm -hmm. Emmy, thank you. Thank, thank you, Emmy. you guys. And get this month's Madison Magazine for all the best in the Madison area. Still to come at four, we'll profile some North Carolina residents who are not evacuating because of Hurricane Florence. They are the wild horses of the Outer Banks. Many people worried about them, but CNN Jeannie Mo says they'll probably just be fine. That story coming up after Dana's first alert forecast. Take a look at this. Grandpa tries to go skiing, but this happens instead. Oh, oh no. All right, Grandpa, let's take another look. He's sitting on the dock enjoying the day when suddenly he flies out of his skis like a torpedo. 
Despite saying hit it to the driver, he is clearly caught <laughs> off guard while trying to ski at Lake Dunlop in Ontario, Canada. The good news is, after his head for a splash, Grandpa comes up smiling. How many people have done that? A lot. You're ready or not? Yeah. Today is Thursday, September 13th. It is Positive Thinking Day. It is also Bald is Beautiful Day, so let it shine. Let it shine. It's yes. also Snack on a Pickle Day. I think I will. Do it. All right, the word pickle derives from the Dutch word pekel, which means brine. Now, the pickling process uh, was invented right around 1440. Now, each of us Americans eats about nine pounds of pickles per year. I Do you make a serious above dent in that. I eat nine pounds a week. <laughs> You have a pickle every day, right? I do. Every I, day. I love pickles. A little, like a sweet gherkin well, or a big. No, like... no, the Vlasic, you know, the slices. Okay, so yeah, you may be at nine pounds a week then. <laughs> let's, see, let's see, I'm half Dutch, so there you go. That's fair. So they're peckles. Peckles. That works. <laughs> okay. With our, your our producers guess. had enough pickles. Right? <laughs> yes. No more. So uh, overall, guys, we're enjoying a lot of sunshine. It's beautiful. And quite a warm afternoon outside for us. We'll take a look at what's ahead for the rest of the week and the weekend. Right after the break. Overall, I'd say things look wonderful for us outside. A few clouds. I was just outside, barely saw any, though. Our visible cloud track's not looking too bad for central and southern Wisconsin. A few clouds over towards the edge of Iowa, Minnesota. Uh, but nothing that's blocking out most of the sun. No rain threat for us either, and that's always good news. We stay dry for just a little longer throughout most of the Midwest. We're staying dry right now. Overall, the last 48 hours, we saw showers right at the edge of Minneapolis, stretching towards the northern portion of Minnesota, but we have been dry for the last 48 hours yet again throughout central and southern Wisconsin. So no major rain threat for the next few days. I can't say the same thing, though, as we look ahead to next week. The good news for us, we're not expecting to see any impacts from Hurricane Florence right now. A very strong Category 2 hurricane. 
With sustained winds of about 100 miles per hour, that storm is going to continue to move west northwest and then slide right up along the Atlantic coast. Once it moves up towards the New England area, that's when our storm systems are going to start moving across the country yet again. Until then, though, we have high pressure just ridging through the Midwest, keeping things mostly clear, high and dry, if you will, very mild outside and a little warm as well. We have a little southern breeze, south-southeast flow for us through Madison. That's sending us a lot of heat, also sending us a little bit of moisture. Not enough to create any rain, but enough to cause our dew points to climb just a little bit. We do have a few rounds of rain off to the west, but they're going to stay that way until we get into the start of next week. So we have several more days before we have to be too concerned about any rain chances moving in. It is just a little breezy outside, not gusty. But you'll certainly notice the breeze again coming from the southeast, staying in the single digits for most of the area at about eight miles per hour for Madison, closer to nine in Lone Rock. Temperature wise, it's a little warm. We're above average at 78 in Madison, 72 in Mineral Point, 81 in Janesville right now, 82 in Mineral Point and Low Rock. And compared to this time yesterday, that is just a few degrees uh, cooler for us, actually. Close to the same point in Mineral Point and for Platteville, but a little bit of a drop for us in Madison. Not that big of a drop. Very similar overall to forecast. Dew points also fairly similar. 58 for Madison, 58 and low, 59 in Lone Rock. When it's closer to the mid 40s, that's when it's a little more comfortable. When our dew points start creeping into the 50s, that's when it starts to feel just a little more muggy for us. Overnight, our breeze continues to flow from the south southeast corner, and then we're going to say a mostly clear sky by tomorrow. Plan on just a few clouds in the sky for us for Friday. Friday night, we clear up yet again. No rain threat along with those clouds for Friday. Saturday, not looking too bad. We start off with that southern breeze, temperatures in the 50s, and then by Saturday afternoon, we're back in the 80s for us. The only downside here is actually uh, improving for us. That downside was the pollen levels, ragweed and nettle were fairly high. The good news as we get to through tonight and into tomorrow, things aren't blooming as much. So uh, our ragweed, ragweed levels going back down. They're more in a medium range rather than medium to high. Right now, fantastic outside. A nice blue sky, as I mentioned, barely even a cloud for us. We hit a high earlier today of about 79. It's close to where we're at currently. Overnight lows in the low 50s, so closer to average for then our uh, afternoon highs. Record there, of course, uh, 93 sunset, not until 7:11 this evening. So you have plenty of time to go outside and enjoy the weather, and of course make a wish at 7:11 with sunset. 78 right now for us. That humidity is at 50 percent. You'll notice that if you step outside, it does feel just a little sticky. Overnight lows will be in the mid 50s. That's mostly clear and fairly pleasant by tomorrow. We're going to be warm yet again in the mid 80s, mid to low 80s for us throughout central and southern Wisconsin, 82 in Madison. Compared to our average, we're quite a bit above it over the next several days. We're going to continue to stay warm, so do plan on this warmer air hanging around through the weekend. Overnight lows are also going to warm up for us. And there's that next opportunity for rain creeping back in. And unfortunately, uh, this creep of the rain looks like it's going to stay with us for just a little longer. We have a front that's going to move in and rather than move in and move through, <coughs> it is going to move in and hover. So we do have the slight chance for rain entering late Monday. It won't soak your Monday, but by the time it gets in here, it will be lingering throughout most of the week and into next weekend. You know, that's strange because usually when I, I'm off next week, and when oh. I take a week off, it's usually perfect weather. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's true. But get a lot of TV. And You're stuff. breaking your streak. Yeah. But you can start your Netflix binges back yeah, up, absolutely. right? Absolutely. I have a lot okay. to get through. And and Florence is actually helping our weather. It is. It is by by kind of blocking things up a little bit. We have that high pressure stuck over us, and that storm is of course down in the southeast. It's just sucking up a lot of the moisture and keeping things stalled right now across the country. As that starts to move up towards New England, that's when things are going to start so to switch. A few more days to dry off for us before some more rain. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Million Millions and millions of people have been evacuated as Hurricane Florence approaches. But one population won't leave, the wild horses of North Carolina. And that has some animal lovers concerned. CNN's Jeannie Mose has more. Watch this as well. You know who isn't watching TV to find out when the hurricane hits? <laughs> North Carolina's wild horses. There are over 200 of them on the Outer Banks. Normally they're scratching or strolling the beach or even rolling on the beach, but already they sense changes in the air pressure and are changing their behavior. They started huddling up together, they'll group up together, they go to high ground. Meg Puckett is herd manager of the Corolla Wild Horse Fund. 
The group's Facebook page is a magnet for concern. So worried about them, not their first rodeo. Wild horses have more horse sense than people. If anything can survive this storm, those horses can. Forget evacuating them. Too stressful for the wild horses, too difficult and expensive for the humans. But the experts say the horses, wildly popular with tourists, should be fine. Usually they're territorial, like these two stallions fighting over mares. But when bad weather hits, they band together. They go into those live oak forests and they just hunker down under those trees. Horses have drowned in hurricanes. Five were lost when Isabel struck 15 years ago. But the expectation is that most of these horses should make it. They waited out, put their butts to the wind and waited out. Instead of us riding horses, it's the horses' turn to ride the store. <laughs> Kinimo, CNN, New York. They are so beautiful, they, aren't they? They just run wild. Yeah. yeah. Best of luck to them. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hunker down, yeah. horses. Well, still to come in four, scientists may have come up with a unique way to deal with all the plastic in our landfills and oceans. When we come back, a fungus may prove to be too much for all of that used plastic. We'll find out how when Live at Four continues. There's a live look from the Edgewater Skycam. I'm always looking to see if I can see the UW crew team. 
because they're always on the lake right about now. Susan but, Sun is on the team. <laughs> but I, I can't see them this afternoon, but it's a beautiful day on the lake. Each year, 8 million metric tons of plastic end up in the ocean. And that's on top of tons and tons of plastic that ends up in landfills. Well, scientists in Britain say fungi, fungi may be the answer to winning the war on plastic. CBS's Tina Krause has more on the new research from London. <laughs> Scientists here in the UK are focused on fungi and say it's a forgotten kingdom that is vital to life on Earth. They're not as pretty as flowers. You don't have them beautifully growing in your garden, but, but actually they really are critical for so many things. A new report on the state of the world's fungi claims the organisms could tackle our planet's problem with plastic. Experts say if the natural properties of fungus can be harnessed and developed, plastic could be broken down naturally in weeks rather than years. Of the same species. The renowned Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew in London has the world's biggest collection of dried fungi with more than a million specimens. Fungi have provided food and medicine for centuries, but researchers say the curious organisms hold more superpowers for new fuels, for cleaning up plastics, for cleaning up radioactive waste. More than 100 researchers from 18 countries worked on the new report that warns climate change is threatening fungi habitat in some parts of the earth. Experts admit fungi have a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde profile, helping 90% of the world's plants get nutrients, while at the same time doing irreversible damage to some ecosystems. Tina Krause, WISC News 3. Around 2,000 new species of fungi are discovered worldwide each year. Last year, some of the highlights included finding fungi in dust on an oil painting and one new species lurking ooh, under a fingernail. What? Yeah, I know. Oh, that's scary to even think about. <laughs> All right, still to come. Well, hopefully it'll help the plastic. Yeah, that's true. It can have my fungi out of my <laughs> fingernail. Still to come at four, it's Madison's version of America's Got Talent. It is the Overture Center's Rising Star competition. We'll find out what it's all about, and we'll meet a group of finalists when Live at Four continues.
So right now, things actually look okay for us throughout most of Dane County. The Beltline, of course, moving just a little slow, especially if you're trying to travel a westbound there through much of our eastbound, excuse me. Looking at I, or excuse me, US 151, I do want to point out 151 South, the exit there to I-90 and 94 eastbound. There is a crash there on that exit, so the right lane is blocked this time. It seems to be causing quite a backup along 151 right now heading uh, south towards Madison. Over at 14 from Cross Plains to Black Earth, it's still closed from water on the roads. Downtown, if you are on the Beltline, as I mentioned, westbound at about 25 miles per hour near Fish Hatchery Road, but starts to pick back up speed the further west you get. Eastbound, however, uh, not as lucky, about 16 miles per hour for the speed there near Fish Hatchery Road. We travel a little <laughs> further along, closer to 22 miles per hour there. That's a quick look at your first alert traffic. All right, Dennis, thank you. Now in its fifth year, Overture's Rising Stars is Madison's most exciting talent surge. Auditions were held earlier this summer. 63 acts auditioned, 21 finalists emerged from the competition, and they'll perform this weekend for a chance to win $1,000 and the opportunity to perform during Overture's 2019 season. That's pretty, pretty cool. And joining us this afternoon are four members of the Madison Group North Code. Welcome, Welcome guys. guys. Thank Thank you. Us. Congratulations. Congrats. Nice to see you all. Appreciate Let's it. just go down the line. Introduce yourself and tell us uh, how old you are. My name is Adam Princeton and I'm 31. I'm Craig Hoffman, I'm 30. All right, I'm Josh Pankratz, I'm 33. I'm Ben Strobel, and I'm 27. And, and you all went to UW together? We did. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you sort of met? Yeah, um, pretty much. Back in the day, yeah, we kind of all came together and uh, decided we all kind of like music. Um, Adam and I go back to UW Madison. Um, we've all made our way back to uh, the Midwest after working some professional jobs for a while here. So, Great. getting into doing what we like to do the most. Yeah, as a full band, we've only been around for about a year. How do you describe your genre of music? Indie folk is the word that we've been using. <laughs> okay. Uh, but the Isthmus recently wrote an article about our newest EP, or our first debut EP, and they described us as somewhere between uh, folk, I believe, uh, and a pop Americana. Wow, yeah. interesting. Yeah, definitely some different titles. There. So what, when did you decide to enter this competition, The Rising Stars? Uh, I mean, really, when I heard about it for some friends, I thought it'd be a good opportunity and um, just to get, I don't know, learn more about Overture and everything there. I mean, fortunately, we've been given the opportunity to, you know, hear what the judges and experts have to say. So what was the experience beneficial. like for you? Oh, it was great. Um, I mean, we started, uh, so we started the competition um, just kind of, we went in to see kind of how it would go and, you know, do our best and, you know, hear some feedback from the judges and hopefully, you know, get better and better as as uh, we keep playing together more as we've all only been together for a year. And, and we're um, looking at some of the, the competitors here. It's not all just music. There's no time for all. You can actually do anything. There's dance, Absolutely. there's music. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There's a lot of really great, talented acts uh, this year as well. And um, it's really cool to see it all be part of it. So what do you think when you heard you were a finalist? It's pretty exciting. Yeah. 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 We were told that of the 21 finalists, there are 19 new acts that have never been in the competition before. So to be a part of that yeah. cohort, our first time playing on Capitol yeah. Theater stage at the Overture Center is, is a pretty awesome opportunity. And you're going to be performing at the Night Market tonight right. um, yeah, yeah. and we also are. at the Willie Street uh, Willie Street Festival, too. Yep, on Sunday we'll be playing. Yep. And, the, weekend. and the competition is on Saturday. <laughs> you guys got a busy, yeah, busy, yeah, busy, busy weekend, weekend sure. coming up. Sure. Let's uh, tell excited. you when you can see the, the Rising Stars Talent Search finalists tomorrow night, 7.30, Capitol Theater at the Overture Center. Tickets are only $10, and for a list of all the finalists, go to overture.org, and I understand that you're going to play for us. What a treat this is. What, what's, what's the name of the song? The song's called Secrets. It's an original of ours that we're actually playing for the competition. All right. All right. Take it away. That's good. Right. <clears throat> well, Adam gets it Go ahead.
November 15th, 7.30, Overture Center. Tickets, $10, overture.org for more information. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks guys. Good luck. Appreciate Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another beautiful evening. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure you get outside to enjoy it. That's my recommendation always when it's nice outside. So for the last few days, we've just been steadily warming right on up. Temperatures over the next few days, of course, will be in the low 80s for us. Notice where we should be sitting in the mid to low 70s. So we are just a little bit above average. Uh, everyone's been calling it kind of our last little flavor of summer because we know fall is just right around the corner, about a week away for us for the first day of fall. Uh, and then things will start to cool down rapidly before we know it. Warm Badger game on Saturday. Yeah. Warm yeah. Packer game at Lambeau on Sunday. Warm Packer game, yeah. All right. Thanks, Dana. Thanks, Dana. Tomorrow here on Live Before, we'll meet a UW grad who's behind some of the funniest lines and skits on late night TV. And we'll wrap up the week as we always do with the best animal stories of the week. It's Lola's Lowdown. That's coming up tomorrow on Live at Four. It's the